All right. Hey, good morning, church. Let's begin our worship this morning in God's word together. Psalm 69, verses 30 through 36. The psalmist says, But I am afflicted and in pain. Let your salvation, O God, set me on high. And then he continues in verse 30. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than an ox or a bull with horns and hoofs. When the humble see it, they will be glad. You who seek God, let your hearts revive, for the Lord hears the needy and does not despise his own people who are prisoners. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them. For God will save Zion and build up the cities of Judah, and people shall dwell there and possess it. The offspring of his servants shall inherit it, and those who love his name shall dwell in it. Such promises from the Lord and a call from the psalmist to the people of the Lord to praise the name of God with a song, to magnify him with thanksgiving. The choir has prepared uh, an arrangement of we gather together to ask the Lord's blessing to begin our worship service this morning. We're glad that you've chosen to join us this morning for worship. We're thankful for your presence here. We're thankful for your presence for joining us online. Uh, as we continue uh, to just uh, think about Thanksgiving, we've got a, a tasty meal to gather for tonight. You're going to hear maybe a few more details about that later on in the service. But we encourage you to join us tonight at 5 p.m. in the CLC for um, small, a small bite of food and fellowship. Um, I, I want to turn our, our opening announcements over to Ms. Kim Stein, who has some information for you about Room at the Inn and our backpack ministry. Good morning. First of all, I want to tell you a little bit about what, uh, just real quickly, what Camelsville Baptist Church has done this year for our community. Uh, through our backpack program. Uh, right at the end of the school, we received uh, names of children from both school systems that uh, really could use a little extra help for food. So we provided food for uh, right around 100 children uh, with 
we dealt with 35 families. Uh, we had people here and we packed boxes of food weekly and was delivered and loved on. Uh, right before school started, the host families that dealt with these families got to take these children school shopping and they got them a couple of outfits uh, to get them ready for school. We partnered with Shoe Sensation who were phenomenal and they gave us a really good deal and each of these hundred children got to come to Shoe Sensation. Their foot was measured and they got to pick out whatever shoe they wanted and that was such an awesome day just to see these children, see them running all over the stores uh, in their new shoes. It was really cool. We also brought before you all uh, backpacks and you all were so generous to fill these backpacks for these same hundred kids and had them ready to go back to school. They had the supplies that they needed. Uh, they had new clothes to go to school and a new pair of shoes, which was amazing. So thank you all very much for that. Now we're turning our focus into the Christmas season at Room at the Inn. And uh, we're gonna do it a little different this year. I want you to mark your calendars. It's gonna be uh, on Monday night, December the 12th in the Fellowship Hall. From six to eight, we're gonna serve them a nice meal and we have some gifts for them. Uh, Sunday school classes have been collecting staple items like laundry detergent, shampoo, body wash, just all kinds of different things. So we are packing totes full of these so when the families come in, they'll be able to take a tote home of staple items. Um, during this meal, uh, we've got, we're gonna have some special Christmas music. Uh, Pastor Dwayne's gonna do a devotion and share with them and we just wanna love on these families. The main thing we're doing different this year is we have an angel tree. So I'd like to invite you all to um, come up after the service. You can pick a ball off the tree. All of those balls on the tree represent a child. And on this ball, it will have, if it's a boy or a girl, it'll have uh, an age or a grade. And we have ages starting at three months up through 17 years old. And it'll have the child's name. If you come over to the table and talk to Miss Virginia or I, we're going to give you a card. And on this card, it's going to list their sizes. It's going to tell you a little bit about your child. Uh, what they like to do, their favorite color, what school they go to, and then they listed a few things that they would really like to have for Christmas. So you take this card, um, you just purchase whatever you felt led and are able to do. We're gonna ask you to wrap them, tag them with the child's name on the back of the card if you'll just list what you've bought. So we wanna try to make sure that each family and one child doesn't open two or three boxes and the other has a lot. So we're gonna to try to work on that. So that'll be very beneficial if you all will list this. Make sure you bring this back because this has got the number of the family so we can put the gifts for the child with the right families, okay? Um, I wanna leave you with a verse because we're really excited about this. I want to leave you with Matthew 25, 40, and it, and it says, Truly I tell you, whatever you do for these brothers and sisters that are mine, you do for me. So just bear that in mind. Also going to ask for volunteers on the 12th. We're going to need people to greet, to welcome these families in, and, I, we, would, and we need some people to help them take because they're going to have totes of staples. They're going to have bags of gifts. Most of these families, uh, the average of them have four children, so that's a lot of toys. Help them get all this to their cars, and then we would just like people to come and sit with them, eat with them, welcome them, and love on them, and just kind of show them the love of Christ. So if you have any questions after you think about this, you're welcome to come up and talk to Virginia or myself. You can give me a call. You can call the church office, and they can get you uh, in touch with me. But I just look forward to see what God's going to do through this ministry to uh, love on these children. Thank you all very much. Amen. Let's stand and continue in our worship together. Father God, we just pause to give you thanks for the opportunity to gather to worship we thank you for the opportunity to be on mission uh, that you've called us to i pray that you'll help us consider our role as a church as individuals um, 
and what this may look like for uh, Angel Tree, Room at the Inn, a way for us to love on our community that you have ordained this church, Campbellsville Baptist Church, to be in this community for such a time as this. Help us serve you, be the hands and feet that you call us to be. In Christ's name, amen. Let's worship. gospel this morning church amen give the lord the praise notice the singularity here in our songs there's one gospel amen amen paul writes about it in three and four in romans we're just going to keep hearing that word this morning and in christ alone our hope is found in christ alone Hope is found, He is my light, my strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving
we hear the story of Peter stepping out on the boat. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And, and the Lord answered, come. So Peter got out of the boat. He walked out on the water and he came to Jesus. And when Peter saw the wind, he became afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, oh, you of little faith. Why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped Christ, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Where are you this morning, church? Where are you, believer? Where's your faith? Are you doubting? Listen to what Jude writes. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory majesty dominion and authority before all time and now and forevermore when our faith is weak he will keep us when I fear my faith will fail Christ will hold me fast when the tempter would prevail he will hold me fast i could never keep my hold through life's fearful path for my love is often more he must hold He 
of his sovereignty together. He will hold me fast. He will hold Amen. Take your copy of God's Word, turn to the book of Romans. It's been good to sing praises to Jesus this morning, hasn't it? Amen. Romans chapter 4 is our text. This morning we'll be looking at verses 1 through 12. The Apostle Paul has been writing about a very significant topic that we have studied in chapters in chapter three really towards the end of chapter two into chapter three the fact that salvation is by grace alone through faith alone in Christ Jesus alone and does not require observance of the Mosaic law or the sign of circumcision Paul recognized that many of his Jewish readers will find this hard to accept. And so he makes an argument using an example of the greatest hero of their faith, which would have been Abraham. Why would Paul, why would the Apostle Paul use the example of Abraham? Well, 
if you think about it, we all love stories. We all love to hear stories. We often love to tell stories, especially if they happen to be true stories. Stories from our history or stories from our past seem to catch our attention and really resonate with our hearts and minds. We love to pass these stories on to others. One pastor suggests, speaking of Abraham, by using Abraham as the supreme scriptural example of justification or salvation by faith alone, Paul was storming the very citadel of traditional Judaism. By demonstrating that Abraham was not justified by works, the apostle Paul demolishes the foundation of the rabbinical teaching that man is made right by keeping law. That is, on the basis of his or her own religious efforts and works. If Abraham was not and could not have been justified, made righteous by declaring the law, then guess what? No one could be. So this morning, we will learn from God's Word, no one, including the great patriarch Abraham, is justified by works because a person is justified by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone. Stand with me this morning in the reading of God's Word, beginning here in our text in Romans chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Pray with me. Lord, it has been good to be in your presence this morning, worshiping together with brothers and sisters in Christ as we are preparing our hearts for this Thanksgiving season. We know that there are many, many things that we can be thankful for, that we should be thankful for, but I can't think of anything greater to be thankful for than for our salvation by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. We give you praise, Lord. And as you continue to teach us from your word what that looks like and what that means and what that doesn't mean, Lord, help our hearts to be in tune with your heart. Lord, remove any distractions, anything that could distract us from hearing from you this morning. But not only, Lord, from hearing from you, but also, Lord, for living this Christian life for your honor and for your glory. So, Lord, as we continue to walk through the Word, Lord, teach us some significant, powerful truths about yourself. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Really, in... Chapter, uh, chapter 4 here, we see two overarching ideas that we're going to walk through. Number one, no one is justified by religious works. No one is justified by religious works. This almost sounds like a repeat of what we've already heard earlier in chapter 3, but the difference here is that the Apostle Paul is going gonna, is gonna to give a, an example. He's going to give the story of the life of Abraham, which would have resonated with his Jewish readers to prove his point that no one is justified, no one is declared righteous by religious works. Paul's going to use the example of a heavy, 
home run hitter in Jewish history, Father Abraham. In fact, we're going to see this morning and next Sunday that Abraham is the entire focus of chapter 4. First, what we see here in the text is that Abraham was not justified by his works. Abraham was not justified by his works. Go back to verse 1. And Paul writes, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. The New Living Translation, I think, is really helpful to kind of give the gist of what Paul's getting at here. Abraham was, humanly speaking, the founder of the Jewish nation. What did he discover about being made right with God? If his good deeds had made him acceptable to God, he would have had something to boast about, but that was not God's way. So the idea is that Abraham was a big deal in Jewish history, and that is probably the understatement of the century. It's like saying that Tom Brady is a big deal in the NFL. I mean, it's just huge. And in Jesus' day, rabbis said that Abraham got right with God by keeping a set of rules called the Mosaic Law. So how did Abraham manage to do that since he lived 500 years before God gave the law on Mount Sinai? You ever thought about that? The rabbis explain that Abraham anticipated the requirements of the law, kept it perfectly, through a series of ten temptations and earn the right to be called the friend of God. Now this would have been from their really apocryphal writings. And so following Paul's argument here, if Abraham, the founder of the Jewish nation, was made right with God by his good deeds, then he would have had something to boast about. But that cannot be because we've already established the fact in the book of Romans that God's method of setting people right excludes all boasting. Remember, go to chapter 3, verse 27. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded by what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law or the principle of faith. And so that's already been debunked, that idea that we boast, that we have anything to boast about. But that cannot be because we've already established that fact in Romans. Abraham may have had something to boast about before others, but certainly Abraham did not have anything to boast about before God. That's what Paul's saying here in Romans chapter 4. Then what does Paul say in verse 3? For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, real quickly, before we jump into that quotation that Paul gives, it's from Genesis chapter 15, don't miss, this is really significant, don't miss what Paul did here. This is very instructive for every believer in this room, for every believer that's going to watch this Recording. Paul teaches us here that number one, the Old Testament is Holy Scripture. The Old Testament is Holy Scripture. When we look at the Old Testament, it is not, it is not lesser than the New Testament. It is God's Word. It is Holy Scripture. And Paul's saying, let's go back to the Scriptures. When he says that, he's speaking of the Old Testament. But also, Paul teaches us that the Bible is a unified book. It's not that the Old Testament says one thing and the New Testament says something entirely different. Paul can use Abraham as an example for believers in this time or in his time. So the Old Testament is Holy Scripture. The Bible itself is a unified book. And Paul teaches us here that Scripture is our final authority. Scripture is our final authority. Regarding matters of faith, regarding matters of practice, we always must start with what does Scripture say? Amen, church? A lot of times we want to say, well, what does our culture say? Or what is my heart telling me? But as believers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we don't get our cues from the world, and we certainly don't want to get our cues from our own heart, We want to make sure that we get our cues from God's Word. 
That's where the final authority rests. We must always, always, always start here, church. What does Scripture say? By the way, also notice he doesn't say, what does our rabbi say, right? He says, what does God's Word, what does Scripture say? Abraham was not justified by his works, but it brings us to a second point from the text. Abraham was justified by his faith. He was justified by his faith. Look at verse 3. For what does the Scripture say? Not the world, not the rabbis, not tradition. What does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. So going back to our point a few minutes ago, Paul is quoting here from Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. Remember the story of Abraham. Abraham was a pagan, but God in his grace appeared to him. He called Abraham out. He called Abraham to, to make a great nation, ultimately, to be a blessing to others. Abraham believed, the Bible says, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And the word credited appears five times here in six verses, in verses three through eight, five times in six verses. And it was an accounting term taken from the financial world. And by grace, God would place on Abraham's account righteousness, guess what? That Abraham did not have on his own. God granted Abraham the status of righteous when Abraham believed. Guess what? That has not changed. Move forward to New Testament times. Move forward to, to this day. We do not have righteousness in and of ourselves. Righteousness has been placed on our account, imputed upon us from the Lord Jesus Christ. Our righteousness, the Bible says, is what? Nothing but filthy rags. And so his righteousness is placed upon the believer of the Lord Jesus Christ. Abraham was justified by his faith. Notice nextly in verses 4 and 5, Paul continues with this discussion. Now, to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. So what is Paul doing here? Paul's going to go from the specific example, the example of Abraham, to a general statement for everyone to consider. And here is Paul's point. When a person works and, it, and his employer pays him a wage, it is not considered a gift, is it? When you work, you expect to get what's due to you, right? So it's not a gift, it's a payment of obligation. If the, employ, if the employee does not get paid, the employer is being unjust. So in other words, one expects to get paid when working a job. And the spiritual realm, that's, that's the, the real world, right? In the spiritual realm is totally different. Salvation is not based on a works reward payment system. Doesn't work that way. Salvation is a gift. It's a gift of God's grace. We cannot earn it. We do not merit his salvation. We only receive his salvation by faith. Paul not only says that we can't earn righteousness, don't miss this, he also says that the gift of righteousness has been credited, don't miss this, to those who are actually ungodly. Did you notice that? Paul continues, verses 4 and 5, Now the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted to him as righteousness. So Paul's, Paul's saying here, not only can we not earn righteousness, the gift of righteousness has been credited to those who are actually not godly, but ungodly people. The two amazing thoughts here. God justifies wicked, depraved people out of his mercy and his grace. 
And we all qualify for wicked, depraved people. Paul's already established that fact in Romans. There, there is none righteous, no, not one. He's been very clear about the sinful condition of humankind. And it is God who justifies wicked, depraved people out of the abundance of his mercy and his grace. And don't miss that Paul places Abraham, the father of all God's children, in the category of the ungodly. That would have really have gotten the Jewish readers' attention. It would have been a shocking statement for Paul to give the illustration of Abraham and to include Abraham in the, in the list of the ungodly. J.I. Packer, great theologian and author, says, God justifies you, don't miss this, with his eyes open. He knew the worst about you at the time when he accepted you for Jesus' sake. And the verdict which he passed then was and is final. How amazing is the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That when he justified you, when he justified me, he did it with his eyes open. One pastor said the doctrine of justification by faith is not that some people just need God to make up for that little bit that they cannot do on their own. Jesus didn't pay 20% and I can pay the other 80% with my good deeds. That's not how it works. Jesus didn't even pay 80% and I pay 20%. The gospel is that upon the cross, Jesus Christ paid it all and he paid it in full. To further build upon his point, Paul's going to turn to another heavy hitter for the Jewish people. In verses 6 through 8, he's going to bring up the example of King David. Look at verse 6. Just as David also speaks the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Verse 7, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. David, King David, is helpful to Paul's argument that no one is justified by religious works. Because although Abraham, guess what, lived prior to the law, some 500 years, David lived squarely under the law. And furthermore, if you know the story of King David, he committed several flagrant fouls against the law when he broke at least three of the Ten Commandments in one fatal swoop. Remember, David coveted Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, commandment broken. David took Bathsheba in an act of adultery, commandment broken. And then when Bathsheba became pregnant, David had her husband, Uriah, murdered so that that he could marry Bathsheba and cover cover up his sin. Commandment broken, three out of the ten. David couldn't count on keeping rules and doing good works to get right with God. Are you with me? David was a lawbreaker. He had broken at least three of the Ten Commandments in one fatal swoop. He had broken the rules. So what could David do to get right with God? It's a good question. In fact, let's just bring it home. Not just David, but what about you? What can you do to get right with God? Absolutely nothing. David could do absolutely nothing. His case was totally hopeless. And guess what? Your case is totally hopeless before the Lord as well, in and of yourself. Now Paul's going to quote here, don't miss this, from Psalm chapter 32, verses 1 and 2, to make his point and remind his listeners of the blessedness of the person who is reckoned by God as righteous apart from the law or apart from works. He says, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. David's lawless deeds were forgiven. His sins were covered and not counted against him because of what David did. No, David, David and all of us deserved punishment, deserved hell. 
David was writing from his own experience here in Psalm 32. His, his sin with Bathsheba resulted in sorrow and it, and it resulted in remorse. You see that kind of language in Psalm 51. The forgiveness that followed relieved an enormous burden of guilt from David. Now listen, there are many, many things of which you and I should thank God for this Thanksgiving week. We should be thankful for family and church family. We should thank God for the freedom that we have to worship freely. We should thank God for roof, a roof over our heads and food in abundance upon our tables. And here's one more thing that you and I should thank God for this week on Thanksgiving Day. Through Christ Jesus' atoning death on the cross, your sins are forgiven, they are covered, and they are canceled. Not because of any good deed that you have done, but because of grace through faith in Christ Jesus. Praise His holy name. A former college professor of mine was preaching in Liberty, Mississippi years ago, and he encountered a man who was up on a ladder painting. My professor asked the man if he could talk to him about Jesus, and the man replied, well, my religion is the golden rule, right? And my professor wisely replied to this painter, that's lovely if you keep it. But what do you do when you know that you have been an absolute stinker and have not lived by it? And the man had no answer. If a person begins to try to live by the golden rule or the Ten Commandments, what can possibly make up for years of disobedience to God? Or the the occasional disobedience now? Once wrong with God, no one, no one, no one gets right by good works or by keeping rules. No one is justified by religious works, not even Father Abraham. Furthermore, no one is justified by religious rights. Go to verse 9 in the text. Paul's not finished. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised? In other words, is is this blessing only for the Jew or also for the uncircumcised, for the Gentile? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that the righteousness would not be counted to them as well. So what's going on here? In verse 9, Paul says, is this believing then only for the, or this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? In other words, is this blessedness, the blessedness of forgiveness and justification only for the Jews, only for the circumcised? Or does God intend it for the Gentiles, for the uncircumcised as well? And we talked about this a few weeks ago. The Jewish rabbis believed that circumcision could set a man right with God. Without circumcision, no one goes to heaven. And with circumcision, no one would go to hell. Father Abraham sat before the gates of hell in their history to see that no circumcised man ever entered in there. And so Paul is once again going to go back to the Old Testament. And there he found that carrying out religious rites even those commanded by God did not put Abraham right with God. And so there's two important things here that Paul argues. Number one, don't miss the win of Abraham's circumcision. In other words, don't miss the chronology here. Don't, don't miss the timing. Paul's argument was based upon when Abraham was circumcised and why Abraham was circumcised. We're going to get there in a few minutes. 
Here's the when argument or the chronological argument. The rabbis who argued that circumcision made Abraham right with God ignored the fact that God declared Abraham right with him at least 13 years and two chapters before Abraham was ever circumcised. Let me explain. The record of God's counting Abraham righteous stands in Genesis chapter 15. But guess what? Abraham was not circumcised until Genesis chapter 17 when Ishmael, his son, was 13 years of age. So guess what? On the day that God told Abraham he was right with God, he was as uncircumcised as any Gentile. Are y'all with me? This means yes, this means no. Y'all, okay, good. That means circumcision had absolutely nothing, no religious right, right, has anything to do with getting right with God. So why was Abraham circumcised? And that brings me to the second part of Paul's argument here. Don't, not only don't miss the when of Abraham's circumcision, don't miss the why or the reason for Abraham's circumcision. Look what he says in verse 11. Abraham received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose, here we go, was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that the righteousness so that righteousness would be counted to them as well and to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised but also walk in the footsteps of their faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised what's going on Abraham's circum- circumcision was not to confer right standing with God but to confirm right standing with God It was the seal of right standing with God, which Abraham received, guess what? Not by religious works, not by religious rites, such as circumcision, but by faith. So circumcision was a sign that pointed beyond itself to that which it represented. It's a lot like baptism for us today, right? It was an outward sign Outward sign of inward things that had happened in the heart. As a seal, circumcision authenticated the righteousness by faith that Abraham had while he was still uncircumcised. And as a sign, it revealed that Abraham already had faith and that God had already accepted him. So what is the significance of this argument for Gentiles? In other words, what difference does this make? Notice what Paul says in verse 11, second half. The purpose was to to make him, Abraham, the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. So what's going on here? Paul is arguing that believing Gentiles, non-Jews, can call Abraham their spiritual father. Believing Gentiles are a part of God's family too. Gentiles do not need circumcision to be included in the family. You see that, by the way, in the book of Acts, when the early church meets. Abraham was justified when he was uncircumcised, and the same is true for all the uncircumcised. The Gentiles do not need to become Jewish in order to become Christian. By the way, I was singing this with my children this morning. We were going down memory lane remember the song that we used to sing in children's sunday school y'all know where i'm going don't you father abraham had many sons and many sons had father abraham i am one of them and so are you so let's just praise the lord and your right arm yeah yeah, you get that part yeah (laughs) by the way now i know why that's a children's song I did it this morning, right arm, left arm, right foot, stick your tongue out. I did all of it this morning, and I was totally exhausted by the end of that song. So sing those songs when you're young, all right? Here's the deal. By the way, that song is a good summary of our text this morning. It really is. No one is justified by any religious right, R-I-T-E. No one's justified by religious right. No one is declared righteous 
by an action, okay? Like baptism is important, but baptism does not save anyone. Circumcision did not save the Jews. So what does that mean for us today? No one is justified by religious right. Nobody gets right with God through some religious ritual. Those who believe that mass makes someone right with God are misinformed and wrong. Those who believe that baptism is, in, is essential to salvation are wrong. Abraham was saved by faith and not by religious rites nor by religious works. By the way, Baptists even struggle with this. Walking an aisle, being baptized, or belonging to a church has never saved anyone. You can join this church and every church from here to Timbuktu and you can be baptized in every lake, pond, or baptistry in the lower 48 states, but neither church membership nor baptism will ever save you. Why? Because no one, including Abraham, has ever been made right with God by observing religious ceremonies, religious rites, or religious rituals. So what have we learned this morning? No one, including the great patriarch Abraham, was justified by works because a person is only justified by grace alone through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone. Have you ever studied the Jewish Holocaust? Truly, it's fascinating, and at the, at the exact same time, it's appalling. We should be grieved by the pictures and scenes of the Holocaust. One scene that I ran across recently that grieves me is a picture from Auschwitz above the entryway to this concentration camp where the words Arbeit macht frei. The same thing stood above the camp at Dachau. It means this, work makes free. In other words, They were telling these Jew, the Germans were telling the Jewish people and these concentration camps that work will liberate you. Work will give you freedom. It was a lie. It was false hope. The Nazis made the people believe hard work would equal liberation. But a promised liberation turned out to be nothing more than horrifying suffering and even death. Arbeit macht frei. One reason that phrase grieves me is because it is the spiritual lie of this age. It's a satanic lie. It's a religious lie. It is false hope. An impossible dream for many people in the world. They believe that their good works will be great enough to overcome their bad works, allowing them to stand before God in eternity and say, you owe me the right to enter into your heaven. It's a lie. Work does not liberate It's the love of God that liberates. It is not religious works, church. It is not religious rites, church. It is the blood of Jesus Christ shed upon Calvary's cross that liberates. He died in my place. I have trusted and believed in him by faith, and I am free. Amen? Stand with me. Arbeit macht frei. Some of you would probably never say it out loud. But in your heart and by your actions, 
you seek to live your life in a way that reveals to others that you believe your good works will eventually save you. It's a lie. It is false hope. It's a satanic lie. Many in the world have fallen for it, and even some in the church. And this morning, Jesus, once again, is presented before you. And He is the one who liberates. He is the one who gives freedom. He is the one by His death on the cross that sets mankind free. Have you trusted Jesus by grace, through faith, in Christ Jesus alone for salvation? Any other means, church, religious works or religious rites is insufficient. Father in heaven, your word is clear. If religious works and religious rites were unable to save Father Abraham, then religious works and religious rites are unable to save us as well. Because mankind can only be saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone. Lord, thank you for the clarity of your word. Lord, may we live this message of the gospel. May we share this message of the gospel. May we be thankful for this message of the gospel that you place your righteousness upon ungodly people, including me, including those in this congregation. We praise your holy name, and we do so for all of eternity. Father, this time of response belongs to you. God, if there's any person in this room that's been trying to work their way to Jesus, God, would you open their heart and open their eyes that Jesus alone saves, plus nothing, no, no religious right, no religious work. It is Jesus and Jesus alone. Father, have your will and your way during this time of response, we pray in your name. Amen. We're going to invite you. We're going to sing. And as we sing, maybe the Lord has stirred your heart this morning and you just need to pray with someone. We invite you to step out and come. Our, it's not the action of walking up an aisle that saves anyone, but it gives you the opportunity to talk to some prayer partners who would love to walk you through God's word, how you can know that you know that you're saved. Let's sing together. has found a resting place not in device nor creed I trust the ever living one his wounds avail for a plea I need no other argument I need no other plea it is enough that Jesus died
God is good <laughs> all the time. Amen. Hey, be seated uh, just for a moment. I'm going to ask Jason and Kayla Beasley to come and stand with me. Um, I had the privilege of uh, or being doing an internship with Jason. Gosh, it was two years ago now. It was kind of in the middle of COVID or right before COVID, so it was it's uh, kind of crazy, but we had the opportunity. It was just a real blessing. And during that time, or shortly thereafter, I believe he joined under watch care. He was still a student uh, at Campbellsville University. Uh, but over the last few years, he and Kayla have been coming. They've been coming faithfully to our church, and they want to make it official this morning. They come uh, to move their letter from Eastside Community Church in Richmond to join our faith family here at Campbellsville Baptist. So if you rejoice in that, let's say amen and let's thank the Lord. Amen. They were also married back in August. So congratulations to you guys. And we're really thankful that they're part of our faith family. Um, Y'all remain standing. Madison, you come and stand with. This is Madison uh, Bishop. And uh, Madison has been coming as well to Campbellsville Baptist faithfully. She's been involved in our worship ministry as a volunteer, just a real blessing. She comes this morning making it official that she wants to move her letter from Green River Memorial Baptist Church here to Campbellsville Baptist. So if you rejoice, let's let the Lord know and let's just praise his name. Amen. Amen. Um, Right after the service, Uh, These individuals are going to be standing up here. You want to come by and just love on them. Let them know how thankful and grateful you are that they're a part of our faith family. All right? All right. I'm going to turn it over. Y'all can be seated. Just from Pastor Will's going to come, and we've got some closing words, and we're going to, we also have the vote coming up for our 2023 proposed budget. So hang on. I tell you what, it's been a great, uh, great weekend for us. We just, we came back from Pigeon Forge at about 11.30 last night with our teenagers. We had one that accepted Christ while we were gone. And so uh, just a wonderful weekend and a, and a great ra- way to wrap it up. Um, as we close uh, this morning, um, this Connect card, listen, God's on the move. He's doing some things. You want to be a part of them. We want you to be a part of it. Fill that out. Drop it in one of the boxes at the end. And if you are tech savvy, you can scan that little QR code and it'll step you through all the prompts. Um, we just uh, want to encourage you to continue to give as we wrap up the year. As you can see, we've got a lot of ministries going on. And so um, we just encourage you to do that. There are several ways uh, that you can do that. They're up there on the screen. And also, um, this church Thanksgiving meal this evening. You do not want to miss that. Uh, we've, we're doing things a little different. If you see on there, on, that, on the screen there, you know, A through L and M through Z. Now, we've not done this in a few years because of COVID. And so we want to make sure that, that you guys bring, um, bring the desserts and bring the, the side dishes, okay, so that we can have an enjoyable Thanksgiving meal this afternoon at 5 p.m. Come out and, and just hang out with us a little bit and that gives us an opportunity to to get to know you a little better and you to get to know us as well and so we just want uh we want to encourage you to come out and for that